Welcome to the Coach's Roundtable. I'm Ed Cody, and welcome our guest, former University of Pittsburgh quarterback, now Associate Athletic Director for Major Gifts, color analyst on Pitt Football 93.7, a fan, Pat Bostic. Pat, how you doing? I'm doing good, Ed. How are you? Good, Pat. And this uh, 150th anniversary of college football should be noted that you led the Panthers to two of the biggest wins in school history. I know you never get tired of hearing it. The 2007 upset win over undefeated number two ranked West Virginia. What really hurt uh, the Mountaineers and uh, the joy of Pitt fans was that you beat them in Morgantown. And then the following year, 2008, you go into South Bend and beat the Irish 36 to 33 in quadruple overtime. I don't know which one stands out for you, one better than the other. Yeah, you know what? They're uh, they're pretty close. Um, obviously, winning the brawl in the fashion we did, you know, being down, being twenty eight point underdogs, and uh, knowing what was at the end of the uh, the rainbow, I guess for them, um, was pretty sweet. But for me, you know, growing up uh, in Central PA and, and being a uh, you know an Irish Catholic family. Uh, to play in South Bend, that was my first time ever there. My grandparents had gone there as kids. They were big fans. And my first time ever there, I started at quarterback and was able to win in the longest game in Notre Dame Stadium history. For me, that's uh, hard to top. Well, and th this season for Pitt 2019, a lot of fans looking for that kind of excitement this year with the Panthers. Let's go back last year, Pat, 7-7 uh, seven and seven Coastal Division champs. Uh, finish with three straight losses. So how do we judge 2018 season? How did the Panthers build on it? Both Coach Narduzzi and Athletic Director Heather Light both say that the program's headed in the right direction. What's your analysis? Oh, I think it's for certain you know, heading in the right direction. I, I, I thought, um, you know, you look at the changes that were made in the offseason to address some of the weaknesses that the 2018 team had. You know, its passing game really held it held it back. Um, in those three consecutive losses to uh, to Miami, um, Clemson, and then obviously uh, Stanford in the bowl game, uh, Pitt was unable to muster a consistent passing game when their run game was was stymied, and uh, that was the story all year. Notre Dame game last year in South Bend. You mentioned uh, you know being there ten years ago, um, but last year they had an opportunity to win and beat a ranked team. And uh, they just weren't able to put drives together at the end of the game, and it came back to a passing game that was inconsistent. So Mark Whipple's a new offensive coordinator. I've seen a lot more variety in what they're doing offensively, a lot more of a rhythm passing game for Kenny Pickett. Um, so I thought last year was a, was a year of progress. It was a taste of what you know will be to come. Um, but obviously this team needed to be more complete to compete at that level and finish the season strong. And uh, I, I think this year they've got the right pieces and and parts, and, and they're getting them in the right places to uh, um, to continue that that process of becoming a complete team uh, that competes for an ACC championship. Pat, no question. Last year, that strength was an outstanding offensive line. All of them have graduated except for the center, uh, Jimmy Morrissey. The two outstanding uh, running backs, a uh, thousand yard seasons from each of them, Hollison and Hall. So that's going to be overhauled, but you have the receivers coming back. I remember asking you last year about the receiving core and uh, you agreed that it was inexperienced. This year, it's just the other way around. You have uh, three or four experienced receivers uh, head, headed by uh, Taysir Mack and, and French. And as you mentioned, Whipple is, you know, he did a heck of a job at UMass with, with that offense there and put up a lot of points. He just couldn't stop anyone. Yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the, the obviously the change in coordinator. I thought that was warranted. It also fits right in with the personnel they have returning. You look at the offensive line, I think, it's it certainly is a less experienced group, but I think it's a it's a bigger, more athletic group, which lends itself to, to something that they were not good at last year, which was pass protection. Kenny Pickett was under duress quite a bit. They didn't help uh, him obviously with getting the ball out quicker, uh, which is ultimately when he was more effective. But this group is is a much better pass blocking group. They're longer, more athletic. Uh, you've got NFL looking guys. Whereas last year they were they were kind of. Plotters, they were they were downhill, um, you know, man scheme run game. This year, I think it's a more zone scheme, a little bit more finesse, if you will. It's still going to run the football, but 
I think they have the parts to be uh, an offense that can, um, can can get back and throw it. They can they can throw screens and get out into the space. I like this offensive line, um, and I think again that fits into the puzzle uh, when you look at the receiving core that is back with Maurice French and Taysir Mack, Trey Tipton, Aaron Matthews, young guys like Dontavious Butler Jenkins uh, and Shockey Jacques Louis. They have. Uh, plenty of talent out there, and uh, I think they're going to have some time to get it to them in a, a variety of different ways to uh, to deploy that receiving core. Pat, uh, let, let's look at the, the defense. Uh, it, it's been a trouble spot uh, up and down for the four years that Narduzzi's been there. Last year, six games, 35-plus points a game, and now you, you take a blow in, in preseason with uh, Rashard uh, Weaver going down, and it seems the experience is in the secondary and some question marks that – linebacker this this defense for Pitt to have a big year 9-10 win season the defense has to improve dramatically they ha- they do and I thought they got better as the season went on last year right I mean obviously early it was tough with UCF and, and Penn State but uh, you, you look at some of the games they put together do put some points on them obviously but later in the year they, they, they really held a, a Stanford team in, t- in check with a, with a first round draft pick talent quarterback and a great wide receiving group uh, obviously, they didn't have Bryce Love. I thought, for the most part, they were in really bad spots against Clemson. But for the most part, except for the, the, the first play of the game notwithstanding, uh, they acquitted themselves decently in that game. And they return everybody on the back end. Uh, I really like that that group with Demar Hamlin and Paris Ford. Uh, you know, man in the safety positions, Dane Jackson and Jason Pinnock are as good of a, a tandem at corner with Damari Mathis coming in there off the bench as you're going to find in the league. Linebackers, again, that, that's going to be some new faces there for sure. Elias Reynolds back in the middle. Kylan Johnson's transfer from Florida. But I think the strength of this defense is up front um, and in the back end. Uh, obviously losing uh, Rashad Weaver is tough, but Patrick Jones came on strong last year. They got a good nucleus inside. They're well coached. I anticipate that this defense will be the anchor of this team, and uh, I look for them to have a really big year in 2019. Well, the stage is set for Saturday night. The Virginia Cavaliers come in eight and five last year, close the season with an impressive twenty-eight to nothing win over South Carolina. They have one of the best quarterbacks in the ACC, and Bryce Perkins. He's going to test the uh, Pitt defense, and then defensively, they're really excited about their defense, a veteran secondary led by All-American Bryce uh, Hall. This this will be quite a contest uh, for bragging rights to start the season off Saturday night. No doubt. I mean, I think it's a uh, it's it's a litmus test to start right off, right? I mean, this is a preseason Coastal Cha- uh, Division favorite in, in Virginia and, and the reigning Coastal champion in, in Pitt. So uh, you know, a lot a lot will be said in this first game. There's no warming up night game, ACC Network um, in at Heinz Field. You know, Virginia. I, I I get why they were picked preseason. You know, they they don't have any weaknesses. You look across the board, maybe offensive line where they don't have any seniors, but they're um, they have some there's some some vets there, some guys that have played. Perkins is dynamic. Um, defensively, they are very bend but don't break. Um, so they come in with with a lot of uh, a lot of confidence, and they ended their season strong last year. But you know, I think Pitt takes that uh, to heart. You know, they're the reigning Coastal champion, and they were picked fourth. You're playing a team out the gate that's picked to be better than you. Um, there's nothing like starting a year with a chip on your shoulder, and I think this Pitt team has a chip firmly planted on their shoulder that they're going to take into Saturday night and, and hopefully come out with a victory in, a, in a, what would be a very, very big win. Hey, Pat, thanks for joining us. Uh, your, your insight. Uh, look forward to seeing you s- uh, Saturday at Hines and the start of another great football season at Pitt. Looking forward to that. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'll be right back with Alan George. I'm back, joined to my right by the Swami, George Abraham, to the left by the Tiger, Albert Campman. Good to have Pat Bostic on in this 150th year of college football. He engineered two of the legendary wins in Pitt history in 2007. That upset win over West Virginia and Morgantown. That was great. When the Panthers were 28-point dogs, the Mountaineers were number two undefeated. Rich Rod was already making plans to go to Michigan, thought he had the game wrapped up. You know, if he wins that game, history's a lot it different. Is. It right. is. They were wanting him in Alabama. Mm-hmm. 
Isn't that something? Yes. And then the next year, 2008, he takes the Panthers in the South Bend. They're dogs again. He beats the Irish 36-33 in quadruple overtime. I asked him which game maybe stands out a little more for him historically. Which one do you think? Which one did he say? Notre Dame. He grew up Irish Catholic family well, on the why. East, okay. and his family was huge Notre Dame fans, and they took him there when he was a kid. So that was a huge uh, win for him. Yeah, there's a lot of legacy about Notre Dame in this area. You know, there's so many families that live and die with Notre Dame. Yeah, he, and he's good. Uh, you know, he'll grow a little older. He gives that insight. He gives very that, good. He's very valuable on that broadcast. He knows the defenses. Yes, he does. Well, let's go to high school football spotlight, and we'll get to college football here in a second. Top rushers in uh, week zero, Teddy Ruffner of Mars. And not surprising, they do it year in and year out with a great running attack. He had 197 yards and three touchdowns. Anthony Kaminsky of Carn City, 153. We'll see him in a couple of weeks with that game with Monotol. Nathan Hyatt, Slippery Rock High School, 116 yards and three TDs. Matt Goodland of Knock, 115. And Cole Spencer from Pine Ridge, 105. Top passers, Cole Spencer, Pine Ridge, 203. He gives them 308 total yards in that 21 to nothing win over Penn Hills. Gabe Lawson of Seneca Valley, 192 in the loss to McDowell. Vito Pelosi, Slippery Rock High School, 11 for 12 for 170. 79 yards and 247 total yards. The Rock's going to have another nice team this year. Brady Thompson of Monotol, 127. And Luke Bowser of Union AC Valley, 117. Receiving Ethan McDevitt of Monotol, two receptions for 111 yards. David Duffalo, Slippery Rock High School, 6 for 88. Luke Meckler of Pine Richland, 6 for 79. Tanner Merwin of Union AC Valley, 6 for 66. Caden Rainey of Union AC Valley, 6 for 48. And Luke Miller, Pine Richland, 4 for 42. Our top golf scorers, girls, Paige Scott of Butler, 2 under par, 33. The Tornado, 3 and 0. For boys, Matt Lennon of Pine Richland, a 33. Braden Setnar Butler, a 34. Ryan Bartos of Seneca Valley, a 35. Nolan Nicholas and Austin Albert of Seneca Valley, a 36. And Jacob Wolak of Slip Rock High School, 1 under par. 71. Let's go to our football power rankings after week zero. 6A, Pine Richland still at the top with that 21 to nothing win over Penn Hills. Their defense was uh, tremendous, holding Penn Hills to 25 yards rushing, followed by North Allegheny, Central Catholic, Hempfield, and Seneca Valley, 5th 0 and 1. They need to straighten things out if they want to stay strong. They have Central Catholic at home this Friday night. <laughs> Yeah, that's one thing. We'll find out in a hurry if we're any good or not. Because McDowell's pretty good, too. Yes. yes. Right? McDowell pounded him. Yeah. Uh, rushed for uh, about yeah. 250 yards. Yeah. That's on the first him. thing I thought. I thought, oh, McDowell's got a team. In 5A, it's Gateway with that uh, impressive 46-13 to 13 win over Bob Palco's uh, Mount Lebanon Blue Devils. Welcome to 6A. Followed by USC with a new coach. Peters Township, Penn Trafford, and Mars in 4A. It's Thomas Jefferson, Beaver, Newcastle, South Fayette, Bell Vernon. In 3A, it's Aliquippa, North Catholic, Beaver Falls, Central Valley, and Grove City. In 2A, Wilmington, Still Valley, Charleroi, Washington, and Freedom. Wilmington will take on uh, Farrell, who started off with a, a loss last week. And in 1A, it's Olsh, Jeanette, Laurel, Rochester, and Clareton, now we go to week one, and things start to heat up right in the conference play with a lot of teams. Yeah, you don't uh, have much time to get good. They start too early. I believe Pennsylvania starts too early. It's, it's, it's not too late now. It's too early. Yeah, it's too, Honest to God, yeah. I can't yeah. just start this week and get it right. There are two teams I can mention right now. I won't say their names. They had, they had meet the players. After the, after they play the game, yeah, after the game. <laughs> no, yeah. when does that make sense? Eddie? Uh, it's, Meet it's, the here's our players. Yeah. Well, they already played the darn yeah, game. They're zero and one. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and the other thing too, they don't have enough time. School starts so early; they didn't even have two weeks of what we used to go do a day. Yes. Remember the uh, the old, we we used to have three weeks of practice. Yes. We, we used to go a lot of times three a days that yeah. we would. We I will would say this: we were ready. They're all going year. They went to a million passing camps. But then again, 80% of the teams don't pass yeah, the ball. Yeah, they don't throw the ball anyway, so what's the right. difference? Yeah. <laughs> it's getting those guys up front in the trenches exactly. ready. Exactly. Our stories of the week, it's college football preview, the history, the 150th year of college football, 1869 Princeton and Rutgers in 
Who was there for that? Bill Moore. Bill, Bill Moore was there. Coaching he, the Princeton Tigers. The Tigers. Oh, you sure he wasn't yeah. playing? No, I think he was <laughs> coaching by I, I'm a huge college football fan. <laughs> it, it's the pageantry, the rivalries, the bands, the fight songs. Let's go back and give credit to the guys who made it what it is today. And you start with Walter Camp at Yale, who won three national titles. Yale's right at the top with uh, all-time victories. Amos Alonzo Stagg at the University of Chicago. And then you have Grantland Rice, who made famous the Four Horsemen at Notre Dame, the Seven Blocks of Granite at Fordham with Vince Lombardi. You go from those guys to today to Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, par five schools that all have their own uh, networks and billions of dollars in revenue. Yeah, the history of sports is something that the modern kid does not care about, and it bothers me. That we we all read the books and we all they don't watch read. Them. No. You know, they, no, they won't take they won't take the time. Read. So those ones you mentioned right care. there, you know, Camp and Stay and who they they'll say what, what do they do and said that's why we have football today. You, you know, they studied know. all the older coaches was Urban Meyer, and he learned oh, yeah. about about promotion commercialization from Newt Rockney of Notre Dame. So let's look at the goat the uh, coaches the greatest of all time, and I have right at the top. Paul Bear Bryant, Alabama, with his five titles. And followed with him is Newt Rockne in Notre Dame, three titles, and the number one winning percentage all time, 88%. You have to put Saban in there at no number question. three with six titles. And after him, Frank Leahy of Notre Dame, four titles, and the second highest win percentage of all time at 86%. Woody Hayes, Ohio State, five titles. Urban Myers, three titles, two different schools, and he's third all-time in winning percentage at 85%. And who's fourth? Jake Gaithers, Florida A&M, 84%. It was Gaithers who said speed, you either have it or you chase it. Yep. <laughs> and the guy left out, Eddie Robinson of Grambling, 400 wins. At one time, no one was sending as many players to the pros yeah. as Eddie Robinson at Grambling. Uh, Bud Wilkinson, Oklahoma, three titles. 47 straight victories, and that was my introduction to college football as a kid when Notre Dame played Oklahoma and Norman and snapped their 47-game win streak. That's the first game I remember. How about that? That's quite a list, and uh, I don't think you could go wrong with it. I'm glad you got Eddie Robinson on there because he, 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 he won. He won with dignity. And he, and he won not getting all the best players. And he said, okay, mm -hmm. give me the players who want to come play at Grambling. And then all of a sudden the great black players started coming, and then he really dominated. And the advantage was in those days, Duffy Darty, Michigan State, they went down in the south, got a lot of those players sure. who couldn't play, and that's why the, the Spartans were, were powerful in those days. But I want to also add that Jock Southern in the pit, who's often – I can't understand why they never named a stadium after him in Pittsburgh. Three national titles, great teams, and number 10 there at Army, Coach Earl Red Blake, what I consider the greatest coaching staff of all time. Oh, How one. about those assistants? Vince Lombardi, Tom Landry, Sid Gilman, Bill Yeoman, Paul Dietzel, and Murray Warmoth, who won a national title at Minnesota. Yeah, listing those coaches, just think about those – Rooms were like when they had those coaches' meetings. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Think of that. Many, <laughs> and I came across an interesting story. The Notre Dame-Alabama connection. In 1919, there was a, a tremendous high school football player out of Chicago by the name of Frank Thomas, who was born in Muncie, Indiana. Who recruited him? Newt Rockney of Notre Dame. He went on, went to Notre Dame and played on a national championship team in 1921. His roommate... George Gipp. How about that? He then leaves and goes to become a coach at Alabama. And in 1934, he wins a national championship as Alabama's coach. His star player, Paul Bear Bryant, who he hires in 1936. Bear Bryant always said the greatest influence in his life was Frank Thomas. There are two statues outside of uh, Bryant-Denny Stadium. Paul Bear Bryant. And Frank Thomas. And you want to add a little Butler news to it? Who broke all of George Gibbs' records at Notre Dame? Terry Hanratty. Wow. That, yeah, that, there's, that's what I said, the history of sports. 
the history of college football is outstanding. We're going to hear a lot of the stories this year. They're going to – because of the 100s. Yeah, they're going to come out with a lot of the stories. You, you can't make something like this up. You, no. you, it, it sounds like a fairy tale, but that's the Notre Dame. And Bear Bryant said they put my tombstone, never beat Notre Dame. He was uh, twice Notre Dame denied him national championships <laughs> when he had undefeated teams. He lost twice back to back years to Air Parsegian. Yeah, that's another name you're going to put in the coaching in that coaching tree yeah, too. Bo sure. Would be far yes, off right. No, no, he just not only hurt him, know. never yeah, won that exactly. national championship. Uh, now, guys, here's the thing about I was looking at, at college football. We've said this before: the big games regular season count. Exactly. You, the ask Ohio State, 49-20 loss to Purdue. Ask Michigan fans want to know why Harbaugh hasn't made it to the playoffs. He's 1-9 and nine against ranked teams. In college basketball, Duke could lose twice to doesn't North matter. Carolina. No. It doesn't matter no. when it comes to March. So every week, there's a playoff in college football. If Notre Dame goes into Georgia and beats Georgia, Georgia's out. But if Notre Dame goes to Michigan and loses to Michigan, then they're out. And that's late this year. I don't yeah. remember that game Not. being this late. Yeah, and then LSU, yeah. Yeah. they got to beat Alabama and Auburn if they, they want to make Texas it. Texas next week. They How? lose that game, you're starting behind. Yeah, but that's you what can't I'm saying. League games every, 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 every week is an elimination game. The big games, regular season count. And that's what I love about college football. People who love college football look forward to the big games. They really do. They don't They don't want to see Appalachia State no. and USC. They want, they want to see Notre Dame and Georgia. They want to, and you see yeah. it weekly. Texas, LSU. Yes, and those yeah. are big games coming immediately, right on the schedule. That's why these people like Penn State playing Idaho. Don't give me that ten years ago crap because Idaho was never any good. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, let's look at our top ten. You guys jump in. Uh, Clemson number one, followed by Oklahoma. The reason I like Oklahoma's offense and the fact that I, their schedule is favorable to them going undefeated. Only one bad thing, and we talked about this. You got to beat Texas twice. Well, that's that that makes that a little that, harder. They'll they're, run those other eight. They're, they're, they're two eliminations. Yeah, they'll run that other there. eight. You know what I mean? I, I really like. I told you, I like Oklahoma. I liked them because of the easier way to get there. No, let me ask you guys something about this. I have Alabama number three. You might say why. I looked at their last four games last year. They gave up 127 points, yeah. 30 almost 32 points a game. Have teams figured something out about their defense? You know, they got. Pounded forty-four to sixteen in the championship. But don't game. forget three of the last four: Auburn, the East winner, and Clemson. I mean, yeah, I agree. You have to know. I agree. It was against. But still, oh yeah, they, 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 they pride they themselves on yeah. defense. Yeah, they got pounded pretty good. Yes, but, but, but their game has changed. The game, not their game. The college game. The game has changed. You understand? Giving twenty-four points up in a game. It's considered a yeah. good defensive good game. Boy. You're right. And that's why you put Clemson number one with Trevor Lawrence because it all starts there with that quarterback. Yeah, when you have a quarterback, you, you a lot of things taken care you of. You heard what right. said about him yesterday. Mm -mm. You're not going to believe it. What did he say? Greatest quarterback ever. Wow. wow. One year. That's saying say a that. lot. I don't, know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That means Urban, yeah. Urban, is that word hyperbole? Is that what it's called? That's the word. He's yeah. using too Good much. Job. Let him go. Let him play another 10 years. He's yeah. an animal. Before, before yeah. you came home. Greatest yes. ever. Talent? You might say greatest talent, but you can't say no, greatest no, quarterback. Right. No, one year. I don't no, agree. No. I, we finished with Ohio State, Georgia, LSU, Texas, Washington, Notre Dame, Oregon, number 10. Uh, surprise team for me this year. I think it could burst in in the top ten is Michigan State. I really like Georgia. I, I picked Georgia. That's why I'm, I'm staying. With. I think they've developed the best talent, and they get the from back coming back for the third year. I like Georgia. George likes, George likes Oklahoma. My surprise team is Utah. I really like Utah the, and Southern Cal. How about that? I like Southern Cal this year. I, okay, yeah, listen, you're, 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 you're reaching. Yeah, no, but yes, yeah, you're, I do. I they, like they have a Cal. lot of players yeah. back. It's a question. You know about what them. I would? I got a question about the, the non-power five. Central Florida, Boise. I think Army could sneak in there. Central Florida Cadets. will be at Pitt. 11 They'll be marching. 11 Great to see them. I hope they do. Well, I love that. The, the big game coming up this week at Pitt versus Virginia. Oh, oh. You know, uh, Narduzzi's 3-0 and in openers at Pitt, but that's been against Youngstown State, Vill Villanova, and Albany. Virginia comes in with Bryce Perkins. 3,500 total yards last year as a quarterback, 26 touchdowns. Uh, and they have a good secondary led by another All-American, Bryce Hall. The question for Pitt and Arduzzi's fifth year, 28-24, when do the 10-win seasons, major bowls, and top 15 rankings come? I can answer come? that. Never. I would say never also, but I do like them against Virginia. 
I think Pitt at home is, in that first game is going to be Virginia. It's going to be very dangerous. Pitt's going to Pitt's going to beat them up. We're going to see what happens. Yeah, that's a fight. It was visitor every time till last year. The one thing that concerns me, I heard a guy in the ACC now just open mm-hmm. up. He said he didn't think Pitt will be able to score. They they really Not like score. they really like Virginia's defense. They're, they better like it. I, I don't saying that that's hard to believe. Well, they're feeding off that twenty eight to nothing shutout win over South Carolina. Yeah, that's why they have a new offensive coordinator. They got out. They went out and got somebody to try to remedy that. So we'll hey, see what happens. Just down the road here, Slippery Rock University, Coach Lutz, eleven and three in two thousand eighteen, oh, yeah. rated number one in the PSAC, number seven division. Two, they open uh, on September 5th, Thursday, a tough one at Wayne State. Uh, last year made it all the way to the quarterfinals. The hunted. They're the hunted issue. He, he Coach Lutz, you better know that's coming. That before you play IUP and they say, uh, now there'll be four teams before then saying, Slip Rock's coming to town. Right, seventh in the country. Yes. They're, no, they're the hunted. They're not going to surprise he anyone. To use that word relentless. They better be. Yep. And uh, close by, Grove City, the Wolverines coming off their best year in 21 years. Same thing with that. Coach D. Donato has things going. The brick-by-brick brick philosophy, the bowl win over Morrisville State. Mm-hmm. Uh, running back Wesley Schools returns with nearly 18 yards of rushing and uh, outstanding passing attack with those two receivers, Cody Gustafson and Cameron Drake. Mm-hmm. They open up September 7th at Juniata. And George Westminster, Hello. seven and four. Yep. They they we did the game last year. Unbeknownst to us, Westminster lost the championship when they gave Grove City that last second touchdown. Thirty six. They would have won the league. Now this year, West Minnie and Thomas Jeff- or W and J both go to Case, so it's up to Grove City to knock Case off at home. And finally, uh, Penn State, the Big Ten East. They were 9-4 no. and four last year. The openers with Idaho and Buffalo before they get bit. Franklin, in his sixth year, says this is the fastest team he's ever had. But he would like to move out of the East, away from Michigan, Michigan State. Because <laughs> he compares it to the SEC West and, and says that it's overloaded. He's he's a, he's a, a talker. He's a smoozer. He he knows what he's saying. He he's going to put the thoughts in people's minds because they do. That's one they do have. He's recruited speed. Yeah. They really got. But speed. they he lost be, all their playmakers. He better be smooth under oath too, because with this doctor <laughs> suing him, it's going to be big. Yeah, it's, that's a bad. Well, situation. well, I look I look at them. I look for eight and four for them, and I'm going to say for Pitt seven and five. Well, those are two good records you this know. year. That's, I, I think you're on it. You know, if Pitt wins seven games, that's a good year for Pitt. I'm telling you. I, I, well, don't they have it, to win? Saturday? Yes, win, they I gotta, seven. They're going to win that. Listen, they got some tough games. They're at Syracuse, Miami. Oh, no. Syracuse is loaded. Oh, they, they, they have some, don't knock out uh, uh, Boston College. None of those teams. No. They're all equal with Pitt. Oh, Virginia Tech? You they're all equal with Pitt. Hey, that does us for us this week with the college football. Next week, we're going to take a look at pro football. We're going to have the Steelers' Bill Hillgrove on. We'll get an inside look at the Steelers. We'll see you then.